Hello and welcome to Nerd Roamer. This is your host, The Cross, coming to you from our studio. Here at Nerd Roamer, we love nerding out about the history, science, and culture of the places we travel. But we got tired of burying our heads in guidebooks. There's so much out there to see and do. Let us do the heavy lifting on digging up fun facts and fascinating stories about the places you travel. Whether you're on the road or just want to learn more about the world out there, we've got you covered. Deep dives for long drives. This is Nerd Roamer. Roam wisely. It's hotels. And you might be wondering, what's the deal? Well, we're going to tell you. What are we talking about here? Let's get some basic definitions out of the way. So first of all, the Anasazi. So this is going to be the last time during this podcast where we're going to use this word. Um, sometimes people also will refer to these people as the cliff dwellers. Um, the interesting thing about the term Anasazi, this is not the name that the Anasazi people used for themselves, and it's not a word that their descendants used to refer to them. Uh, it's a Navajo term for ancestral Puebloan people that inhabited the desert southwest prior to the arrival of the Navajo. Um, and so the Anasazi people are going to live in this region from about 1500 B.C. to 1500 A.D. or A.D. 1500. But from now on in this podcast, we're just going to refer to them as the ancient Puebloan people. Um, the word Anasazi actually means ancient enemies or ancient ones. You kind of get a sense for why their descendants wouldn't really want to take on the name enemy. It's really not their name for themselves. The Navajo, and this is something, you know, I feel like I did not understand correctly for a long time. While they inhabit a lot of the same locations that the ancient Pueblo people did, they're actually descended from Athabascan indigenous people that traveled from Canada and Alaska around the year AD 1400. They are not descendants of the Anasazi. I think that's a common misconception. Um, but the Navajo are one of the indigenous peoples that inhabits the same area of the desert southwest that the ancient Puebloans did. Another term that's going to come up sometimes that you'll see is people will talk about the Fremont people. And so the Fremont people, some of their territory overlaps a little bit with the ancient Puebloans, but they're going to be located a little bit farther north in central Utah. And the Fremont people are around during roughly the same time period as the ancient Puebloans. They're kind of more of a hodgepodge of related groups. And their culture is going to differ from the ancient Puebloans in that the Fremont people are much more like semi-nomadic. They're kind of like a hybrid between southwestern ancient Puebloans and Great Plains tribes. They kind of remain semi-nomadic. There is some overlap in that they will have some semi-permanent settlements and they will also create rock art in a way that's similar to the ancient Puebloans, but just a totally different lifestyle. So some of the distinctions that will become apparent is, um, you know, for example, the Fremont people will use animal hide moccasins, which is kind of more like what the, the Great Plains indigenous people would use, whereas the Pueblo people will weave sandals. Uh, pottery will become very common among the ancient Puebloans as they settle down more, whereas the Fremont people will rely more on basketry for carrying goods because it's just more portable for somebody who's more nomadic. You will see a ton of Fremont rock art if you explore central Utah, especially. You, you'll see their art, you know, they kind of would be in the areas around places like Capitol Reef, the San Rafael Swell, you went to mountains, kind of Moab area with arches and canyon lands. The classic Fremont uh, rock art is going to be these broad shouldered anthropomorphic figures that can be quite large. And they'll oftentimes have large rectangular kind of bucket shaped heads with some adornment. Um, and you'll also see a lot of bighorn sheep hand imprints. And those kind of things are maybe a little bit less uh, distinct from the ancient Puebloan art. But keep your eyes peeled. You'll definitely see a ton of Fremont rock art if you're in central Utah hiking around. The Fremont eventually gave way to modern tribes like the Ute, Paiute, and Shoshone across a lot of the region that they had inhabited, though whether they're direct descendants of the Fremont people is not 100% clear. One thing to, to pay attention to if you're looking at rock art in the desert southwest is that if you see horses in the rock art, this is a sure sign that the rock art was not made by the Fremont people or the ancient Puebloans because... 
horses were reintroduced to North America by the Europeans, the ancient Puebloans and the Fremont people would not have been familiar with horses. So when you see horses in rock art, that means that that rock art was made by later people, like maybe the Paiute Indians or something like that. What's the area we're talking about here? So the Pueblo people inhabited the Colorado Plateau. So this is that area of uplifted, red rock, gorgeous desert that comprises the Four Corners region of the United States. So we're talking southern Utah, northern Arizona, New Mexico, southwestern Colorado. Really diverse range of habitats that they inhabited. We've got hot, dry lowlands, high plateaus that get really snowy in the winter with juniper, pinyon pine, deep canyons. And the weather is very variable across this region. Shifts in climate and weather patterns are going to be a huge deal as we talk about the history history of the ancient Puebloans. So if you're thinking about planning a trip to these places, or if you're in the area and want to check out some famous sites, some of the most famous ancient Puebloan sites are Mesa Verde National Park. That's the best place to see the classic cliff dwellings that a lot of people think of first when they think of these people. The Chaco Canyon uh, National Historic Park in New Mexico is another great spot that was a hub for the ancient Puebloans for many, many, many years. Also, Canyons of the Ancients National Monument and Bandelier National Monument, among other national monuments and, and other protected land. How do we know what we know about these people? One thing that is super important, I think, are the oral histories of their descendants. Uh, for example, like the Hopi and the Zuni peoples of the southwestern U.S. In addition to that, you know, we have a lot of their dwellings left behind. They classically lived in these pit houses and Pueblo structures, examining the nature of these structures and also doing some radiocarbon dating on some of the organic materials like the log and fiber material that they used is useful for kind of dating when these structures came into existence. In addition, their basketry and pottery techniques changed over time, and those um, things could also be radiocarbon dated. And you can tie those to the structures either by finding them by the structures or matching the radiocarbon dating. The rock art is also important, so you can tie the rock art that the ancient Puebloans left behind to some of the time periods of their structures, because some of the structures, especially ceremonial structures that we'll talk about, like kivas, would have rock art. So you can kind of date um, those two things relative to one another that way. Just to get some terminology out of the way, so petroglyphs, you'll see these terms come up when you're out hiking. Um, and sometimes there will be nice like informational displays if you're in a national park or something like that. Petroglyphs are created by chiseling or carving the images into the rock physically. And this is possible because this red rock that we've got in the desert southwest that's just this beautiful color red is from iron that's deposited in the sandstone and other stones. So you'll have this beautiful red coloration. And then oftentimes you'll notice kind of like a dark streaking on the surface of the rock. And that's caused by oxidation of that iron and manganese in the rock when it's exposed to moisture. So you'll get this, it's called desert varnish. So it's not like, you know, varnish that was applied. You know, nobody went to Lowe's here and put that varnish on the rock. It's from moisture reacting with the iron and the other metals in the rock. So if you chisel through that varnish, which I don't recommend because that's now at this point it's vandalism because we got so many people visiting down there. But if you chisel through the desert varnish to reveal the red rock underneath it's really really visible you can create patterns really easily that way so it's a great canvas for rock art for these ancient people pictographs on the other hand so petroglyphs are chiseled in pictographs are painted onto the rock using pigments so as you can imagine that's a little bit more of a fragile creation and most of the surviving pictographs that we have can mostly be found in areas that are really sheltered from the elements you can date the rock art in a variety of ways in addition to matching it to structures where you find them next to each other or on the structure. You can also look at something called patinization, which is essentially like the weathering and revarnishing of the rock art. So you can imagine, especially for these petroglyphs, that over time that varnish is going to start forming again and it's going to start weathering. And so if you have an area with a lot of rock art that was created at different times, you can figure out which rock art came earlier versus later based on the degree of patinization. 
let's walk through the story of the ancient Puebloans here. Let's let's go through a timeline of their existence because, well, as you'll see, we see this just remarkable kind of rise and fall of this culture. Prior to 1500 BC, this area of the Four Corners is mostly inhabited just by totally nomadic hunter-gatherers. Um, there are some campsites that survive to this day in the Great Basin. So if you listen to the Great Salt Lake podcast, you'll you'll hear me talk about some really ancient hunter-gatherer sites that are found on Antelope Island, for example. And, you know, those people were, were nomadic. They used atlatls and spears to hunt and didn't create the kinds of settlements that the Puebloan people did. Around 1500 BC is when we see the first ancient Puebloan culture that is really significantly recognized arise. They use this classification structure to describe these different time periods of Puebloan culture. And the classification system is called the Pecos classification system. And it's based on a number of things that we mentioned before, you know, the construction of their houses, artwork, basketry, pottery, you know, agricultural practices. And so the first culture is called the Basket Maker II culture. You get a big Encyclopedia Brown gold star uh, if you would guess that the Basket Maker culture was really into baskets. So we'll talk about that in a second. So this time period saw a gradual transition from nomadic to more agricultural living styles. So this did not happen overnight, and it didn't happen the same way in every place. Beginning around 1500 BC till around AD 500, this culture is the first clear culture that is really, really, truly Puebloan. And it's probably created from a fusion of kind of some local tribes and also, as we'll see, some influences from southern kind of more Mesoamerican peoples. You can see this in that agriculture, these people started to adopt maize as a crop. And so rather than being fully nomadic, they are starting to gain some resources from farming. So at this point, because they're growing maize during part of the year, they also started building pits to use as houses and also to store excess crops because What's the point of growing something and putting all that effort into it if you can't store something up for a rainy day? And at this point, in terms of their rock art, there's a lot of overlap in style with the Fremont people. A lot of the rock art that you'll see in the Four Corners region from this time period will still have these kind of big anthropomorphic figures that are more isolated. The baskets, it's all about the baskets for the basket makers. At this time period, we're not really seeing them use pottery yet. Um, They're still semi-nomadic people, so you can imagine hauling around a bunch of pottery is going to be a pain in the neck, maybe literally a pain in the neck. The type of construction of their baskets at this point is called two-rod and bundle baskets, essentially, where they take bundles of yucca or twigs and twist them into a spiral pattern before weaving them into a basket. If you're wanting to check out a Basket Maker 2 site, These are older sites, and they're smaller sites because they're not living in huge, huge, huge cities at this point. Um, One of the best sites is at the Ute Mountain Tribal Park in southwestern Colorado. (laughs) Moving on, kind of around 8500 is where we see this transition to Basket Maker 3 culture. So I know these are really like creative names. Here we're going Basket Maker 2, Basket Maker 3. You could call it Basket Maker 3, Return of the Pottery or something like that. I don't know. They're not necessarily the catchiest names, but they're very descriptive. These, uh, these scientists are very descriptive. And so during the Basket Maker 3 stage, as you could infer, the basket weaving continues, but they really start to weave more complex goods. So this is when we start to see a lot of the sandals start to pop up. And that's something that kind of distinguishes the ancient Puebloans from the Fremont peoples. You also see more hunting with bow and arrow technology rather than strictly spears and atlatl. So where are my crockpot fans out there? Anybody who's a crockpot fan will realize that there are benefits to ceramics. And if you're a crockpot fan, the name of the game is slow cooking, baby. And during this time period, you would have an absolute um, soul connection with the Basket Maker 3 people. Because as they start to develop pottery, you know, they're, they're developing these kind of just real plain, nothing, nothing with too fancy of a decoration. 
as they start to get into pottery, they're able to expand the range of foods that they can consume. At this point, beans are introduced from South America. And beans couldn't be introduced until this point because as anyone who's made dried beans will tell you, slow cooking is really important and you really need ceramics to be able to do that over an open fire. You see a change in the diet here where some of these other foods that require longer cooking get added in. They also become just generally, as time progresses here, more reliant on maize, gradually less nomadic and more agrarian. As they become more agrarian, you see this permanent settlements get larger. So the pit houses become larger. They become more elaborate. They're constructed still at this point kind of out in the open with roofs made from logs. So they'll dig a pit and then the roof will be made of logs. And we start to see as the villages get bigger, they start to create kivas, which are these large communal ceremonial rooms. And we'll get into the details later. But this is kind of like a community center and church that is oftentimes more for the males in the village, but is kind of this first sign that they're really becoming more about these larger communities and not just small family units. At this point, Chaco Canyon really becomes an epicenter of Puebloan culture, and there are some good examples of Basket Maker 3 settlement if you go there. Next up, as you can see, we're getting into these bigger towns made of more permanent structures. So we're transitioning out of the basket maker period, and they're starting to live in Pueblos. So what do you think the next period is going to be called? It's going to be called the Pueblo I period. We see this gradual transition again around the year AD 750 into the Pueblo I period. And this is when we see the Puebloans really take off in terms of population growth. This is when you start to see more of that true Pueblo style. They'll make these jacal houses, which consist of, essentially, they'll, they'll make these walls out of thin, vertically-oriented poles that they lash together and then dot them over with mud. These are kind of the first above-ground houses we start to really see. And again, doesn't occur homogeneously, kind of happens at different times across the range of the Puebloan people. At this point, there's also a shift in the structure of the society to being more agricultural. So really, we're getting away almost completely from being nomadic. There are some periods of drought uh, during this time where the Puebloans, in order to survive the periods of drought, need to create things like dams to control runoff from the snowmelt in streams. They create these little retention ponds that leave these nice kind of wider open areas of silt with soil that's better for farming. And again, as you're concentrating more on farming and permanent settlements, the structures that they're building are getting larger. And at this point, they're inhabiting them year round. So we're having year round settlements. The Puebloans are also storing up larger quantities of their harvest in storage pits. At this point, many of the settlements are still kind of found on the top of these mesas. Um, and so Mesa, you know, is a tall, flat projection of land. So it's like a big, ta Mesa means table in Spanish. So it's a big table of land that you'll find in the desert southwest. There's a variety of reasons for this. Provides protection from, you know, raiding parties. No one's going to sneak up on you if you're living on top of a Mesa. And also you're going to get more snow and rainfall. So you're going to have some more moisture and precipitation to work with for farming and a lower risk of flash flooding because you're not down in this canyon that's constricted where you could get a big wall of water washing your settlements away. Again, Chaco Canyon is a great place to check out Pueblo One settlements. As the first millennium progresses here, we're getting towards the year 900, and we're entering this kind of Pueblo Two period. And Pueblo Two is essentially like the roaring 20s of Pueblo and culture. This is when things really, really take off. You know, I don't know who the Jay Gatsby of this time period was, but things really get crazy. We've got these huge dams and irrigation canals that they're starting to build. You'll see roads. They make actually roads that, that lead up to some of their larger settlements that are quite developed and terraced farm fields. So the, they're terracing fields for farming. So we are producing maize like gangbusters. It is like on an industrial scale here. Just to show you how important it is, consider that their houses at this point sometimes would have up to 12 rooms. 25% of their indoor space 
winds up being devoted to processing or storing maize. So maize is a huge deal, and they're really reliant on this one crop, which is great. It's very calorie-dense, calorie-efficient, but they're also kind of putting all of their proverbial eggs in one basket here, and that's the maize basket. So keep that in the back of your mind. Very maize-dependent culture. The adobe and stone masonry construction becomes more advanced during this time period, with some of the communities developing the capability of even building multi-story towers for use as lookouts. At Chaco Canyon, you'll see thousands and thousands of people actually gathering there. So we're developing like actual metropolises. Uh, The increase in the population size actually forces people to paradoxically kind of start to have to spread out more just to farm more land and because there were a limited amount of opportunities present in the large settlements. So people will seasonally move out with the precipitation to farm and gather food and then come back to the more centralized city spaces. At this point, we also start to see some business develop. Not everywhere was as successful with farming. So those people would pursue more intricate, highly developed pottery, and then they would be able to trade it for food. So we're we're seeing kind of an advanced economy developing. The kivas grow larger and larger, as you would imagine, And we start to have these big things called like great kivas that are up to 50 to 70 feet wide. And these would have fire pit with a little ventilation hole or chimney, um, a small entrance for the spirits to come in and out of the space, and a big bench that goes all the way around the outside of it. And these would be used for prayers, dances, all kinds of ceremonies. And again, usually the males in the village. But you can see how religion is becoming more of a large-scale thing in these larger communities. In addition to Chaco Canyon, you can also find some sites from this time period at Mesa Verde, Hoven Weep, and at Petrified Forest. The rock art, one thing to mention during this time, is that it becomes more widespread, and the form of it really is in the process of changing. So you go from having these kind of more isolated, large anthropomorphic figures to these little stick figures of men and also of lizards and other animals. And sometimes it's ambiguous what's a man and what's an animal. And so this is where some of that, you know, sometimes you'll hear people talk about lizard men. And and so that, that was kind of a purposeful, ambiguous thing that you'll see in the rock art. And in general, you also see just animals become more common in the rock art. And big scenes and like dioramas with multiple creatures in them rather than just these so so large anthropomorphic figures and some really complex geographic pattern as well. Birds are really common in the rock art and sometimes they're really actually quite anatomically correct. Finally, we're moving on to the Pueblo 3 period. So if Pueblo 2, you know, at this point you might be getting bored. You know, it's like, where's the conflict here? Things are going great for these people. It's the roaring 20s. Everybody's prospering. Cities are growing. You know, where where's the excitement? Well, if Pueblo 2 period was the Roaring Twenties, then Pueblo 3 is the Great Depression and World War II combined because it is bleak and violent. The spreading population seen during the Pueblo 2 period began to face a lot of pressure around the year 1150 or so. We start to see a historic drought develop over the region, and the effects of this drought are compounded by the overfarming of a single crop, erosion, and also starting to see some pressure from some outside indigenous peoples from the north and west as well. Um, eventually, as this drought persists, it becomes less sustainable for these small outposts that had formed seasonally to continue. So people really start to consolidate into the centralized settlements people really start to concentrate, especially at sites like Mesa Verde. So the Puebloan culture, really kind of the epicenter was the Chaco Canyon area, really starts to kind of move to being more centralized at Mesa Verde. And it's during the Pueblo Three period. So up until this point, we haven't seen a ton of the cliff dwellings. And it's during this period that the cliff dwellings in their grand scale really, really take off. So this is where the cliff dweller mystery kind of comes into play. The villages are still quite large in size, I'll point out. So these cliff dwellings are no joke. They are multiple stories. You know, you've still got hundreds or thousands of people living in these cities. Um, They're really, really advanced. 
They backfill the floors to level them on these slopes. They use multiple layers of masonry with, you know, even some mortar that they created from adobe mud. Really, really advanced structures. Typically, you would enter these structures, the cliff dwellings, through the roof um, and climb down with a ladder. And in order to climate control the structures, because this region, as you remember, there's a lot of temperature variation. They often would make them with south-facing windows under an overhang so that in the winter when the sun is low, it would come in the windows and warm the room. And then in the summer when the sun is higher in the sky, they would be shaded by the overhanging cliff and it would keep it cooler. So really, really thoughtful construction of these cities. At its peak, the area around Mesa Verde hosted over 20,000 people. 20,000. In addition to... The cliff dwellings, they also would make settlements in kind of protective kind of box canyons that would offer a lot of shelter and would offer them protection from any raiding parties. During this time, you can see just a proliferation of tools of war that shows that the time was becoming more violent. Pottery and rock art during this time keeps taking off, though. There's no suppression of that. And in fact, this is probably the most prolific period in Pueblo history for pottery and rock art, despite the increasing pressure on the people. It's at this point that we get to around the year 1300, so between 1200 and 1300, we enter the period where people will talk about, quote unquote, the mystery of the Anasazi. You've got this amazing culture, tens of thousands of people making these complex cities, complex art, really advanced construction, really prosperous, excellent farmers, and then you see them gone in the blink of an eye, leaving behind many personal artifacts, um, everyday tools, implements, pottery, etc. And so when people from Europe, for example, stumbled on these ruins, they were kind of, you know, dumbstruck. And this was considered to be such a profound mystery. It was like, what happened to these people? It was like they were vanished in the blink of an eye. Very kind of gothic, romantic, mysterious and mystical. Let's talk a little bit about what happened, but the spoiler alert is going to be that this is probably just multifactorial. Um, so there's a lot of theories about what happened here. For sure, probably the biggest culprit here is that the drought periods that we had talked about worsened and worsened and worsened. And in fact, the period at the end of the 1200s, right before the Puebloans are completely gone, is probably the worst drought in the history of the region of the southwestern United States. So absolutely historic. And you have to remember that during all of this, they're reliant on a single crop, maize. So as the soil becomes depleted, more and more land needs to be cleared for agriculture that then gets depleted and has poor yields. And it just becomes this vicious death spiral where you don't have enough food for the populace. This famine is, of course, going to exacerbate the infighting that was already happening over the food supply. And changes to the weather patterns throughout the continent are going to lead to migrations, not just of Puebloan villages and people, but also of other people into their territories. During this time period, there is some evidence of extreme violence between Puebloan people and with outsiders. Some people with bastion skulls, burned villages, even cannibalism. Uh, as the famine deepened and the violence grew, fertile land along the Rio Grande and little Colorado rivers farther south beckoned. So small bands of Puebloan people had settled there and told the people kind of back in Mesa Verde and these other settlements that things were looking up in these river valleys. In addition, there had been the development of this new religion, the Kachina religion, down in that area that also served as a pull. So between the push of the violence and the famine and the pull of this new religion and the fertile soil of the Little Colorado and Rio Grande, the Puebloans move out of the Colorado Plateau. By 1300, we essentially see resettlement of all of the remaining Pueblo people and the establishment of these huge communities farther south. The 1300s see the resettlement of the remaining Pueblo people farther south into these areas near the Rio Grande. And they established some huge communities there with some Pueblos containing over a thousand rooms. And they established this really elaborate Kachina belief system. After roughly two to three hundred years of prosperity, 
we finally see Europeans begin to arrive on the scene. So we started our story all the way back in 1500 BC. We're now around the year 1500 AD or AD 1500. And we're seeing the Spanish come on the scene. They start to establish settlements in the Rio Grande Valley in around 1598, so in the late 1590s or so. And they impose this really strict kind of brutal rule upon the Puebloan people and their descendants, the Hopi, the Zuni, the Tiwa. They are very aggressive about trying to push them to convert to Catholicism. Everything kind of comes to a head when they arrest some shamans, some medicine men of the um, Puebloan people, and they wind up executing three of the medicine men. The Puebloan people kind of unite in a revolt under a leader called Pope, and in 1680, they stage this revolt and actually successfully drive the Spaniards from their land and wind up maintaining them away from their land, maintaining their independence for 12 years. Eventually, Spain does come back and recapture the lands of the Puebloans. When they do take over again, while they are very strict about maintaining political obedience, they do let the religion thing go a little bit in terms of not being as pushy, letting the Puebloan people continue to pursue their beliefs. After that time, the Puebloan people are able to maintain their belief system through centuries of Spanish and then United States rule. And if you go down to this region today, the Hopi, Zuni, Tiwa, and other descendants of the ancient Puebloans still maintain their religion and cultural practices to this day. So now, as promised, your bonus nugget for this episode. You want some fries with that knowledge nugget? Cocopelli. So Cocopelli, we mentioned before, this guy is widespread all over southwestern United States. Ubiquitous figure you're going to see in gift shops all over the entire region. Little stickers, magnets, little uh, Kachina dolls. You're going to see Cocopelli all over the place. And as we said, this guy date back millennia. Um, so during the early Puebloan periods, we did see him arising in the rock art. He's that stick figure with the humpback and the flute. And when I say guy... I mean Guy, because he was portrayed with a phallus that was quite large, and it's very, very obvious that this was a male figure. The origins of the figure aren't necessarily 100% clear. Some people think that the figure maybe represented a traveling trader who would play a flute and announce his peaceful intentions by playing music, and then would bring goods and things for sale in the bag on his back. Others have posited that the figure is meant to represent this desert robert fly which apparently has a very aggressive tendency for breeding so they're apparently like quite fertile creatures and then in the kachina religion the cocopelli is a lot of things kind of a fertility figure prosperity figure also a little bit of a trickster so different things to different people different things through the years maybe cocopelli has subsequently kind of under the Spanish rule been emasculated and made a little more mm, family friendly, shall we say, and also commercialized. So nowadays you'll see the flute playing figure in stickers and artwork all over the southwestern United States. And he's just also become kind of a quasi universal symbol for southwestern pride. So when you see Cocopelli, smile a little bit, and think of those ancient Puebloans, because that's where he dates back to. If you were interested in this topic and you want to take your own deep dive, I've got a couple recommendations for you. So deep dive number one recommendation is a great general overview written for a lay audience by a guy named David Roberts. Um, So this book is In Search of the Old Ones, Exploring the Anasazi World of the Southwest. Really great overview, has some nice pictures, and very, very easy to locate this book. Another book that's a little bit harder to locate, but I think that you can find online pretty easily and probably in some bookstores in the desert southwest is Indian Rock Art of the Southwest by Polly Shafsma. I think that that's a great book, especially if you're really intrigued by the rock art and really want to know what you're looking at and understand what you're looking at if you're out hiking in the southwest. Definitely recommend checking out one of those two books from either an online source, local bookstore, your local library. Always good to learn more about the places you're going to visit. 
Remember, for updates on future episodes and content, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at NerdRomer. And you can find us to listen and or subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Until next time, keep roaming, nerds.